Hello, everyone. How are we going? We good? Yeah? A little bit more noise. Come on. We good? We're here at the start, at the start, for Australia anyway, of virtual reality, augmented reality. This is amazing. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Be honest. If you're a little bit scared by it all. Wow. No hands. Put your hand up if you are excited by it all. And you should be. We should be excited by this. This is the thing. If we fear the unknown, if we fear the changes that are on, our, on its way, then we stagnate. We don't ride that wave. We just sit still and everything passes us by. Now, the cool thing is, if you're excited by it all like you all are, we get to take on this opportunity. This is a big opportunity to really steer where this technology goes, to be able to make sure that if the world is going to change again, let's make sure we change it for the better. So we get to now ride this wave of opportunity, and I think that's amazing. So this is a little bit about my background and the, uh, the sort of technologies that have led me to working in this field as well. Um, I'll get a next slide, please. Fantastic. So this is uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I am a bit older than I look. Uh, I'm 31. I've got this, um, this great product I use. It's called Half Asian. And, uh, and so quite often people think, I'm not going to listen to this kid. I'm still a kid, but I'm a 31-year-old kid. Now, I got to play around with robotics when I was young. My dad designed this robot, and it was a robot that would take all of my toys away from me. It would just take all my toys, and it would play with them. It would pick up these Duplo blocks, and it would move them around. And that's really difficult for a robot to do, but it had inbuilt artificial intelligence algorithms. And the cool thing about that is it would learn for itself. Everything that it did, it would learn to do better and better and better, and it would keep iterating. Now, what it uh, went on to do was to learn to play noughts and crosses, to play checkers, which it's doing here, and then go on to play chess. Now, I was very lucky because when I was very young, I got to experience this, and I got to appreciate the fact that this robot was learning for itself. Now, that was really cool. I also got to play around with uh, virtual reality devices, some of those really sort of 80s, late 80s, early 90s devices. These things that we'd put on our heads, it'd give us an incredible headache, uh, but it was worth every second of it. And, uh, and that made me think differently about where that technology was going to go in the future when it would make a comeback. Now, these technologies, and all technologies actually, but these ones in particular, you find that there's links between many different areas, so many different fields, and we're going to go into that. Uh, next slide, please. So where I went with it all, I wanted to go into robotics and artificial intelligence. I thought that I'm going to take on that, that road, robotics, artificial intelligence, and hope to go into VR. When I started my electrical engineering degree, uh, 2003, I was thinking about how I was going to be able to go into games like Halo. I loved Halo, and I loved the fact that it was a lot of fun, but I really wanted to see how I'd be able to go into the game, how I'd be able to feel the ground change beneath my feet, how I'd be able to feel the, uh, uh, the gun in my hand, the weight of the gun, and, you know, it's all about um, having the fun behind it, not sort of the world changing side of things. Having said that, that's why I started thinking about virtual reality, and I thought I might start developing things now before, um, before it all comes back again. Now, what I ended up going into was disability, because in the third year of uni, I almost broke my neck. I, uh, I dived into a backyard pool. I was being a kid, being a bit stupid. And I dived into this pool and went straight into the bottom of it. We're going off a diving board. I went straight into the bottom of the pool and almost broke my neck. Now, this moment changed my life because suddenly I started thinking, what am I going to do in this world? You know, I started thinking, if this was a permanent thing, what would I have used to be able to find my way around to communicate? I mean, I had no idea about disability, so I started looking into it. And I threw myself into that field, and what I found were many, many stories, amazing stories. This is a good friend of mine. Her name is Jess. Uh, her name's Jess Irwin. Now, what I found in this girl was when I met her, her carer was standing next to her and she was talking to me and asking me questions. And I was trying to figure out with every response I was giving, can Jess understand me? I was trying to figure that out, but I just assumed that she could. After a little while, she opened up that iPad and started tapping on it and she asked me a question and I thought she understands me just fine. So I sat down with her and started, uh, started talking. Now, she asked me a whole bunch of questions and I realized 
that the fact she was using this technology to communicate was amazing. What I then found was that she had also had it interfaced uh, with a, a camera so that she could actually become a photographer, something she always wanted to do. She loved photography and she now found this freedom to express herself through the technology. So what she became was a professional photographer, graphics designer and website designer running her own business. In a matter of five minutes, I went from not thinking this girl could understand me to finding out that she's running her own business, more motivated, more out there and doing more things than most people I know. And I thought that was amazing. So we've, uh, we've been friends ever since. I've even gotten her up on stage with me a few times to share her story. Next slide. You're going to get to see what she does. This is some of her work. I'm going to get myself out of the way. So this is some of her photography work. She pushes the boundaries. She she has turned her wheelchair up so many times when she's got it bogged in the sand, but she does amazing work and she released her first coffee table album last year and I was a very proud friend. Now what I found from that is that interfacing technologies, that technology that allows you to interface and to interact with the, with the machines, with the technology, with the digital world, that is so important and it's constantly changing and it's constantly giving us new levels of imagination and expression. Next slide. So this is what I went into developing. I decided that I was going to steer all of my, um, my ideas, my creativity, and my work towards the biomedical field. I wanted to design a wheelchair that would be able to allow a person with very high level disability to be able to find their way around in an environment. So this is the, uh, the wheelchair that I'd, I designed and developed through my undergraduate degree and my PhD degree. Uh, its name is Tim. It's a robot. It can see and think for itself. Uh, TIM stands for Thought Controlled Intelligent Machine. We like acronyms when it comes to robotics, I have no idea why. Now, this robot can see with stereoscopic cameras. Who doesn't know what stereoscopic cameras are? Yeah? Okay, cool, I'll explain it then. Um, so stereoscopic cameras, they can see the same way as our own eyes can see. We can see in three dimensions because we've got two slightly different perspectives on the world. Uh, it's not a redundant system in case you, you know, lose one eye. Um, it's a, a way that we can detect how far away objects are. And the way that we do that is if you put, a good example is if you put your finger in front of your face, you close one eye, you close the other eye, you see that it moves. Now that distance between is known as disparity and that can be used to determine exactly how far away an object is. The closer the object, the further apart that it appears between your left and your right eyes. And that's what tells your brain what depth is. That's how all those 3D movies and stuff work. Now, the fact that that camera can see in three dimensions, it's actually got three cameras on it, but it only uses two at once. It can see in three dimensions in front of it. The camera at the back can see spherical vision, which means that it could see 360 degrees. When I started this, this was 2007. The only ones that were using spherical panoramic vision, really, that I could see were Google, uh, using it for the, uh, the Google Maps, but they weren't using video. When you see video in panoramic vision, it's so trippy. Now, what we had there was stereoscopic cameras, and spherical vision cameras. I said, if we put these things together, not only will it make my wheelchair better, but we would create something, a new type of technology that we could travel the world with and film the world in 360 degrees, 3D vision. And when I proposed this in 2008, the people said, why would you do that? And I said, well, we could create virtual tourism for when virtual reality makes a comeback. And we could have had the whole world filmed now, I think I've got some friends here. I can see one right now from Rapid VR. We've got some friends who have been doing this because although that got rejected at the time because I had no idea when VR was making a comeback, um, it's actually happening. And we're getting to see these sort of applications where we can film the world, we can transport ourselves, and that's amazing. Next one. So what do I use it for? I use that so that the wheelchair could see and think for itself. Those technologies could see and think for itself the person could control it with their mind. Then we started moving into new technologies to interface with your computers, to interface with the digital world. Eye tracking systems that can allow parents to know when their kids with high level disabilities, what sort of cognitive abilities they have. If they play games, if we use the gamification so that the kid can play games and they go, the kid can't control his movements, he can't speak, but we know what he understands. And then moving on, starting to look into how VR could potentially change lives. For kids who might not be able to ever travel overseas, VR opens a way to be, to be able to transport a kid to another part of the country, another part of the world, so that they can see the areas they might never see. And that's amazing. For us, it's great. 
for us, it's you know, convenient. It's kind of cool to be able to see the places you might never travel to. It might be cool to see the places before you go there, because it never replaces the real thing. But having said that, the technology can change lives. And so that's what I want us all to think about. So some of the great examples that I've seen, some of the great examples that I've seen around the place have been in many different areas. So yes, we've got some more in disability. Um, this one is some work that I've seen. Next slide. This is some of the work that I've seen in amputees. So when an amputee has, is missing, say, an arm, they can experience what's called phantom limb pain, where the brain starts feeling pain from the limb that they don't have. Now, what we have here is we found that in the olden days, they use mirror box therapy, right? So this has been around for a long time, where they've got mirror boxes that allow a person to look down, put the arm that they have out, and then they see, based on the mirrors, a reflection. So they, their brain suddenly goes, oh, look, I've got both of my arms, and the pain goes away. Now, that's incredible, because that's a psychological thing. It's been proven to be stronger than some of the, the, the strongest pain medications available, and that's amazing. So in the virtual world, we can put the virtual goggles on, we can connect up EMG sensors so that the game knows what their brain is trying to send to the hand that they don't have, and then they perceive that they have an arm. Again, it can help get rid of the phantom limb pain, and that's an incredible example. Next slide, please. Phobias. This one's really interesting. Next slide. Uh, this one's a lot of fun. I think it's fun. Now, when you confront something that you're truly scared of in the virtual world, this is why I give free virtual reality experiences to all of my friends, because I like to see people confronting the things that they are scared of. I thought I got rid of arachnophobia long ago. I got bitten by a huntsman in year eight, and, uh, and then I had this horrible reaction to spiders for quite a long time, and then I thought it was gone, until I played this virtual game where um, I've got the laptop in front of me. It's called Don't Let Go. It's a bit of a fun game. And you've got your finger on the, on the keys, and so does your avatar. So in the virtual world, you're sitting in front of a laptop, and you can see your, your fingers on the keys. This tiny little spider comes out, and it starts crawling up your arm, and I'm watching it go up my arm, up my arm, and then I threw the Oculus off and shook my head. Now, <laughs> the thing was, I didn't actually realize how scared I was of spiders, but I hadn't had a spider crawl up my arm to my face. In the virtual world, you can confront these fears. I got one of my friends to then start working on actually developing this. I said, you're going to develop this. We're going to look into how we can help people get over their phobias. And uh, I said, you're gonna start with the spiders because that's an easy one to, to go with and there's a lot of people who are scared of spiders. Now you're going to design the spider, you're gonna do it with anthropomorphism. You're going to project a personality onto it. So it's gonna be a very animated spider, it's gonna be very friendly and you know, you're gonna wanna pat it, it's gonna be fun. And then it will progressively get more and more realistic. Anyway, I noticed he was sitting there just sweating. He was just sweating. I went, what's wrong? He goes, I'm horribly scared of spiders. And just the thought of this is making, making me nervous. So I got him to, uh, to develop it. That was a lot of fun. Anyway, next slide. So we're moving on to some other, some other applications of where you might see VR and AR. Medical applications. Medical applications. We've got remote surgeries. Now, this is something that's been happening for a little while. It's just going to keep getting better. Remote surgeries, both VR and AR, can, can have a role to play in this. We can find that you might have the best specialists in one area of the world, and they, their services are needed on the other side of the world. The fact that they can basically port in to being in that location and control the robots um, that are doing the surgery or control on a scale that the human hand can't actually control, that's amazing. And, uh, and we're gonna see many more applications in the medical field. Next one, data. Yep, next slide. Data, so these are some of my friends um, who I met uh, from Code Loaf in, uh, in Brisbane. Now I got to play around with this new way of interacting with data. Now we have also the data arena at the University of Technology in Sydney, where you get to experience data in a whole different way. Instead of being in your spreadsheets, it's getting the digital world out and around you. So you can experience it in a whole different way. You can move through masses and masses of data and suddenly it's interesting. It's, uh, it's not like your Excel spreadsheets anymore. Sorry if Microsoft's here. Um, but it's a new way and it's amazing. The fact that you can just go through 
I'm, I'm racing through dates and times and looking at different data from each time uh, period. And, uh, and the fact that you can just sort of hone in on anything, you can have your own little holograms in front of you to be able to see the data and experience it in a different way. Already the data arena, scientists have gone in there with their science data and have been able to visualize all that data around them in amazing ways. And they've already made two discoveries that they didn't know existed before because they weren't able to experience the data in this way. Next slide. Cool. Storytelling. This is the one I'm excited about. Because storytelling is something that everyone needs to be able to do. We all need to be able to tell a different story. And the thing is, storytelling brings up empathy. And this has been claimed by Chris Milk to be one of the greatest empathy machines ever made. The fact that we can now use VR to put yourself into the shoes of someone else, to experience an experience as if you're that person and you were actually there. You will never be able to empathize with someone as well as if you're seeing the world through their eyes. And that's something that's so incredibly powerful and something to think about. Chris Milk used it for, um, it, for filming what the life of a refugee can be like. And that was so incredibly powerful. When he gave that to, to different people around him, to politicians, they were able to experience the life of a refugee as if they were there. It's no longer like a documentary, you're watching it on a screen, you're experiencing it as if that is you. And that, you can't even describe how powerful that is. Next slide. This was done by our friends again. We've got Rapid VR here, go and see them. I don't know if they've got a stand here. I think they do, yes? Go and see our friends. Uh, they worked with Samsung on this. This dude was on one side of the country and his, uh, his wife was giving birth to his child on the other and he couldn't make it. So he was able to port into the live birth so he could be there and see the birth of his child through VR, through that porting. And I think that's amazing. Such a great application. Education. We're getting towards the end here of what I'm saying is some of the many things that can change. Education can change because with AR, we experience it all over again in a different way. Now, the kids these days, they don't want to learn the way that we did. We didn't have the experience, we didn't have the technologies available to learn as multimodal as the kids today can. And I already know that they pick up these concepts, they pick up things so incredibly quickly when they can experience it. And here's a good example of how. Next one. These two kids I met over the weekend. I judged the national finals of the Young ICT Explorers competition for years nine and 10, but I couldn't help get drawn to the years five and six category. The years five and six category, where these two girls decided that they were going to teach others about heart disease. Now they felt so strongly about this that they wanted to teach other kids about heart disease in a way that hadn't already been done. And they realized all the books weren't really doing it. They were able to pick it up from the books, but other kids were not. So what they did, get this, this is great. What they did was they created a virtual reality experience where you're inside an artery watching all the blood cells going by. This is year five and six. Now, what they did was they created all of their own 3D models in Blender. So they created all of the blood cells, they created the artery, they created all of the assets that they then imported into Unity and composited and created the game in and deployed it to the Oculus Rift. Then they started their own website with videos and ex explanations and they were helping through those videos to be able to explain what it is in their experience. On top of that, they used code repositories for their code. So they used Git, they had it all worked out, and they put all of their references and all of their sources and everything that they used on their website and documented it really, really well. Now, this is a whole new generation of kids we have never seen before. A whole new generation coming through. They are technological natives, and they will develop the future. They will develop the future faster than anyone else before them. So your companies are going to need to get used to this and are going to need to get ready for the new wave of kids coming through because also they're not going to work the same way as we do. I say we, but I don't either. They're not going to work the same way as we currently do. So that's what I've seen out in the field, and I think it's amazing, and I think there's many, many more stories we could tell, 
but basically what I want to be able to tell you out of all of this is the world is about to change all over again. We are standing on the verge of a massive technological change, which is amazing because you guys are all here, you're all excited for it, and you're all here to ride that wave of opportunity. So it's no longer about thinking big because our imagination is going to take us so much further. This is where our imagination comes to life. I want to see the next conference, uh, not having all of these little exhibits. I want us to experience those exhibits all around us. If we've got a place like this, we want dinosaurs walking through here. We want to experience every one of the offerings all around us and be able to switch in between, be able to pull up a, uh, a holographic panel and choose which exhibitor we want to see and then experience it all around us. We can do a lot with it, and you're only limited by your imagination when it comes to these technologies. So don't just think big, dream big, imagine big, and ride that wave of opportunity. Thank you very much.